Tonight, drones help ice-bound captains avoid the blue ice, then Chase Nunes from Geek Gamer TV comes on to give us a gamer update. Padres Corner is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Padres Corner is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Padres Corner, episode 24, recorded February 7th, 2015, for February 10th, 2015. Chase Nunes, Gamer Update. Welcome to Padres Corner. It's the show where we put you into the mind of a Jesuit priest and see if you come out sane. On the other side, I'm Father Robert Ballasier, the digital Jesuit Padre SJ in the Twit TV chat room. Padre SJ is here for you. And that's what Padre's Corner is all about. You see, we want to cover some of the stories that have fallen through the cracks, the, the, the interesting tidbits that maybe don't warrant a spot on one of our news shows, but are still interesting enough for the geeks and the gals of the Twit TV chat room. In other words, Padre's Corner is all about the Twit TV army. Now, speaking of the Twit TV army, I know that a lot of you are buried under snow and ice right now. That's just the way that it works all across the world. There are a lot of geeks and gals who are feeling the bite of the cold. So I thought, in solidarity, in solidarity with you, I'd start off by talking about high-tech icebreakers. Now, we covered this story last year. It's about a, a new Russian icebreaker built by master builders in Finland that breaks ice sideways. Uh, this is a $76 million a million euro ship. It was laid down in July of 2012. It was launched in December of 2013. It was finally completed in January of 2014. And it has three sets of 360-degree diesel electric azimuth thrust pods that allow for fine control of the ship. These pods can be turned in any direction to give the crew fine control of how the ship moves through the water, and it uses that fine control to crush the ice. That's because this ship, the Baltica, pushes itself on the ice sheet. Then it shifts its weight in its balance tanks to force the bow down, crushing, crushing the ice. The advantage of this ship over a traditional icebreaker is that it can break a wider swath of ice, wide enough for a tanker or cargo ship. A traditional icebreaker needs two passes to do what this ship can do with one. Oh, this is very cool tech, and it's an interesting ship, and that's why we covered it a year ago. But there's a little wrinkle to that, and that is... Even if you've got the most advanced icebreaker on the face of the planet, even if you've got a really, really good way for you to break through the ice, you don't necessarily have a really good way for you to be able to, well, I don't know, see where you should be going. And that's what the folks over at, uh, at the shipyards have tried to do with the latest innovation in icebreaking which is drones. That's right. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about this, this big ship. This is the MV Nunavik. It's the largest icebreaker in the world, and it also happens to be a cargo ship. Now, for years, they've been using the tried and tested technique of, uh, well, looking where they're going. They cut through the ice. They look for young, spongy white flows that haven't been compressed into steel-killing, meters-thick ice sheets, and they avoid the blue ice, which is typically a sign of multi-year compressions of snow and ice into something that slices through the hulls of, of ships like knives through butter. Now, they, they dive for the leads, what they call the leads, which are stretches between ice sheets that open up in warmer weather or heavy storm conditions. This ship is designed to travel through the Arctic, so it has to use all these techniques plus its massive bulk to break through ice and to plot a safe course. Now, they only tackle the ice when absolutely necessary because, as any sea captain will tell you, even if you have a ship that's designed to cut through ice, it's always risk when you come into contact with something else. Now, the idea is simple. The Canadian company that owns this icebreaker has decided that instead of counting on the bulk of the ship and the technology to be able to save it from the crushing pressure of ice, rather than counting on those tried and true methods of putting someone up in the crow's nest or using high-tech goggles to be able to see and discern where the ship should be going, why not just use ready-made, inexpensive technology to give yourself a bird's-eye view of everything? And that means 
drones. <laughs> That's right. This idea is super simple. A drone can see higher and further away than any crewman or ship-mounted instrument. You also don't need to put any crewmen at risk. You're not sending anyone on an ice sheet. You're not sending anyone, any, anyone in, a, in a dinghy. All you need is a camera on a drone and a crewman who is skilled at piloting it. In Arctic conditions, even a consumer-level FPV multi-rotor can get several kilometers away and several hundred feet above the surface. Uh, from that vantage point, the captain can see exactly where the ship needs to go to avoid the worst of the ice. There, there are a few challenges. Consumer multi-rotors typically don't like high winds, and if there's anything that the Arctic has, it's high winds. Now, also, they're, they're considering using helium balloons with multi-rotor stability in order to give it more flight time. But in the end, the idea of having a small fleet of drones on your ship that you can send up to chart the safest path, even if it means sacrificing a few in that fleet for every trip you make, could be the future of traveling through ice. Now, when we come back, we've got a special guest. We're going to be bringing Chase Nunes on to talk a little bit about a gamer update. That's right, all the, all the gaming news that was fit to print. But in the meantime, I thought that as long as we're talking about ways of using drones to get a better view on things, we should probably take a look at this new super secret prototype program that Twit has been running to get a better view on things. That's right, folks. That's what happens when you have far too much free time on your hands. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the favorite part of Padres Corner for me. It's when we get to talk to interesting people. And this week, we bring on Mr. Chase Nunes from Geek Gamer TV. Chase, thank you very much for coming on. Hey, pretty good. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, was that is that a Leocopter or Air Laporte? I'm I'm confused on that. We're calling it the Leocopter. It's got uh, it. <laughs> it's it's in prototype stages. Um, I, I believe it or not, we're actually making upgrades to the Leocopter. I I'm <laughs> trying to use ducted fans because I <laughs> I want to see how fast Leo can go. Uh, that is awesome. Yeah. Man. Uh, actually, interesting story. Uh, Leo, on my advice, bought a SEMA trainer and a SEMA X5, which is what we've been telling people to train on. Because it has all the characteristics of a larger quadcopter, but it's not that expensive, and it's not going to kill people if it runs into them. Well, uh, I was supposed to train him up first, and unfortunately, he took it outside, and I think he gave it full throttle, and it never stopped. It just kept oh, no. going, and then it was, it's gone. So we're waiting for the next trainer to come in, and then we're going to give Leo some lessons. Uh, until then, the Leo copter will be his presence in the air. I've been, I've been practicing. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of real flight. Uh, oh, yeah, but it's, yeah. it, it, I, I've been practicing with that just because uh, I would say that the first time I flied my friends, uh, uh, he has a quadcopter and he also has, he has some planes and I, uh, I broke it within the first 10 seconds of flying it. So I was just like, he's like, we're getting real flight. You're going to install it. You're going to try it out and hopefully it won't break anything in the future when I finally do pull the trigger on something like that. <laughs> Uh, by the way, I, I do have to uh, throw this in there. We've got a uh, Y guy in the chat room who uh, wisely said that the Leocopter always lands at a Laporte. Ah. Ah. <laughs> ah. Okay. Ding. Okay. Now, let, let's, let's get away from drones because that's not what we're yes. here for, Chase. Sorry. I brought you on because it's been a while since we had a serious talk about games and gamers. I mean, we've, we've had plenty of gamers on the show, everyone from Scott Johnson to yourself. We've had OMG Chad. All these people yep. are deeply involved in the culture of gaming, if not yep. the technology of gaming. So I asked you to, to put together some of the most exciting gaming news since the last time you've been on Padres Corner. Uh, what did you come up with? So I, I got stuff from all walks, uh, from consoles to PC, you name it. Uh, obviously, some mainstream stuff that a lot of you guys out there will be familiar with. The first one, and obviously you mentioned uh, our good friend OMG Chat. He does a Minecraft show, as do I. 
And one of the biggest stories to hit this past year and really in the past six months was Microsoft saying, you know what? We got some extra money to spend. We're going to pull the trigger and we're going to buy Mojang. And so they said, you know, we're going to write a check for $2.5 billion. And obviously when this news dropped, uh, I know a lot of us, including myself, you know, we've known the past of Microsoft and what they've done with acquisitions. And a lot of us were afraid uh, that, oh, gosh, is, is everything going to change? Is the sky going to fall? Is Microsoft going to pull the plug on other consoles and make it an exclusive? I even made a bold prediction that I was thinking, hmm, we're going to see this game on Windows Phone. And I thought they were going to give it away. I was thinking uh, maybe they'll use it to entice more phone sales. That didn't happen. Uh, but yeah, it was it was a big deal. And right now, it still feels like, you know, it's status quo. Nothing's really majorly changed on it. Uh, they just recently announced Minecon 2015, which is going to be in London this year on July 4th, my wedding anniversary. And so it's it's one of those things that so far, I think the jury's still out. But when this happened, Padre, what do you think? I mean, did uh, did you kind of skip a beat and thinking, oh, gosh, is this going to be the big change of Minecraft? Or what do you think? Uh, now, I remember, my background is enterprise. So I've True. known Microsoft for the longest time. But that doesn't mean I'm right. a Microsoft fan. Uh, there's so many things that Microsoft does that just infuriate me. Right. This deal, when I first heard about it, I was like, oh, well, Minecraft's dead. Uh, <laughs> Microsoft does not. I mean, let's look at Nokia. The yeah. last big acquisition Microsoft made, it was kind of a disaster. It did not turn yeah. out well for them or for Nokia. And so I was thinking, I understand why they did it. They were going for that that treasured young demographic. In fact, what this in my head, what Microsoft is trying to do is they're trying to out Apple Apple. Apple did this brilliant long game back in the 80s and the 90s when. It, you know, those of us who are older will remember Apple almost went out of existence. If it wasn't for Microsoft, Apple would have gone bankrupt. Right. But they did the wise thing of getting into schools, getting into grammar schools, into high schools, and into universities. And they won a mind share, which when those people became the generation, only use Apple products. Yeah. Microsoft is trying to trying to do the same thing. They, they've they've now got a mind share, a huge mind share of people who are absolutely dedicated to Minecraft. And I think, like you said, there were a lot of people who freaked out thinking that Microsoft was going to kill it. But because right. it stayed status quo, and because it seems as if Microsoft is is you know hands off, I I think the community is actually they've passed it. I never hear about people saying, "Oh, I'm not developing for Minecraft anymore because Microsoft's going to destroy it." Right. Yeah. No. I mean. You look at the history uh, with acquisitions with Microsoft, especially in the gaming world. Uh, you look what they did with Halo, right? Uh, you know, small little company by the name of Bungie uh, made this uh, great game. And then all of a sudden uh, they bought Bungie, right? They, they they took over the studio and it was the launch console title for the Xbox, not the Xbox One, the original Xbox, obviously. Um, and, and so you get these fears. You get these fears like, oh gosh, are they going to rip it up? Are, are they going to make it console exclusive? Are they going to obviously changed the way one of the things that Mojang's been very flexible with is content creators like myself who make videos about Minecraft. We've seen music videos. We've seen incredible stuff. We've seen OMG Chad and his stuff and what he's done. And so everything that's happened with Minecraft and video and stuff, and then all of a sudden you got Microsoft taking over. And I know there was collective hearts dropping all over the world like, oh boy, great. Yay. And then obviously, you know, Notch is not going to be around. The founders are taking their paydays. And we already know what Notch did with his money. He bought a nice, beautiful mansion. I, I got to ask you about that because yeah. 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 the Microsoft bit hit a lot of people. Yeah. But then it very quickly turned into this sea groundswell of anger against Notch of how could you sell out? Because obviously <laughs> you're selling out. You're saying, look, I'm getting paid and I'm going to take care of myself. Right. And, and suddenly the story didn't become, well, Microsoft has, has bought Minecraft and they're going to kill it. It was the guy who shepherded Minecraft, who we all trusted, sold us out. I I don't blame him. I, I don't blame him one bit. I mean, it, obviously he took a game that I you know he was developing in his spare time and he turned it into something. And then all of a sudden it caught wildfire and then everybody loves it, including myself. And, uh, you know, he got paid. I, I, I commend him. He worked hard, made something great, and now he's spending his money. Uh, I think mo most of us would do the same thing if, if we worked something on hard. If, 
I, I make this running joke on Geek Gamer TV all the time, you know, I've been doing this for a while. And I said, you know, if Google buys us, you know, we'll, we'll gladly take the check. You know, it's, it's one of those things where you work hard um, and you want to see some of those rewards and, you know, Notch, to his credit, he bought a beautiful house. I, I think if I remember right, he outbid what Jay-Z and Beyonce on, on the home. And not a lot of people can say that. I'm just bummed personally, Padre, that I didn't get an invite. Uh, to his uh, opening party uh, for his house. Um, but, uh, and we've been trying for years to get an interview. Uh, but other than that, hey, you know, congratulations to him. The good news is right now with Minecraft, nothing's changing. If not, they're still continuing development. Uh, you know, we've been seeing previews and hints and things uh, for 1.9 that's coming around the corner. So I'm okay uh, with him uh, selling and and making a profit, but at the same time, he's still he's not stopping creating. He's he's not stopping what he's wanting to do, and uh, a lot of us can take motivation from that. I know I do, and uh, you know, good good for him and uh, for everybody out there who's worried that Microsoft's going to do a bad thing. The one thing you got to think about, you guys, is Minecraft is one of the biggest games of all time ever. And I, I think Microsoft is smart enough to know not to screw that up. And if not, make it better and, and nurture it and make it cool. And uh, so I'm really anxious to see what they're going to do with Minecon this year in London. Um, I went to Minecon uh, 2013 uh, in Florida and Orlando, and it was good. It was a lot of fun, but I think it could be a lot better. And obviously, Microsoft knows how to throw a convention or two. Um, so I think we'll, we'll see what they do. It should be a lot of fun. You know, this this is actually a syndrome that I've seen a few times whenever you've got a project that has been worked on by a lot of people uh, as yeah. sort of, a, you know, not something that was supposed to make money, but more of a, a project of passion. It, it was it was the thing that we did because we wanted to be really proud of it. And Minecraft was kind of like that, not just the programmers, not just the people who did all the add ons, not just the people who spent hours and hours and years of development work into it, but also people like you and OMG Chad, who have have really pushed along the popularity and I, I think the reason why minecraft became so popular was a because it was a good game it was very addictive but b because you had people who could speak about why it was such a good game and yeah. so i think maybe that's where that sense of betrayal came from e even if even if you're okay with it saying look he got paid that's fine it's great there's always going to be that little bit that says but didn't I contribute to this a little yeah. bit? And don't I have a little bit of ownership? And do I feel like I'm just getting tossed out with the bathwater here? Yeah, I mean, I can definitely understand those feelings. Uh, but at the, but at the same time, at this at this juncture, you know, at some point, uh, I, I think this can whether it be Microsoft or some other company. What was going to be the next level for Mojang in this game? I mean, obviously they they peaked out, you know, they, uh, as far as um, uh, the amount of copies that have been sold that are out there. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of rumors that maybe around starting at 2.0, version 2.0, that uh, there'll be an add-on pack that you'll have to pay for or whatever the case may be. Because I don't know if you guys remember, but from way back at the beginning, if you got in during the beta level stage, uh, you would get updates for life. And that was one of the things that they were kind of touting out and saying, hey, um, if you want to get in on this now, you should. Uh, but, you know, I know there's a lot of people uh, that feel invested in the game. I know I do. But and uh, if you look at uh, gaming videos on YouTube, I, I, I want to say like I was reading the stat, like six out of 10 gaming videos are Minecraft related in some form. I was just looking on the Fire TV uh, earlier tonight and it's like in the gaming category, it's like mostly uh, Minecraft videos. So, yeah, I understand that some people feel a little like, hey, you know, I should be getting a piece of this pie. But at the same time. Microsoft hasn't changed policies in regards to content creation, and they could have. I mean, we've we've seen them, and I know we we have a story later on talking about uh, YouTube and 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 uh, content uh, pro, uh, uh, game providers and things like that. But uh, they didn't. They didn't pull the plug on content creators and creativity. And you know what? Right now, I'm not seeing anything to poo-poo them about. You know, I'm, I'm I'll take a. I'll take the uh, positive uh, information and vibes from this and uh, keep pushing along. I think nothing to worry about at this point. I, I, I want to add one more little bit of a wrinkle to this, and that sure. is two weeks ago 
we heard about this very cool technology that was completely took everyone by surprise from mm -hmm. Microsoft, the HoloLens. And yes. it, it looked, I mean, of course, this is a rendering, so yeah. this is just their PR. But the people who have actually tried it have said, oh, my gosh, it is so close to what they actually show. It's got great tracking. It uses the Kinect technology in order to figure out where things are in real space. And it doesn't use a screen or a prism like Google Glass or the Epson Muvario. It actually projects images directly onto your eyes so that you get really fine detail. And, and it's... It just looks so good. Obviously, this this little bit here in the, in the video is a, mm -hmm. is a little, a little bit of an allusion to, hey, do you like Minecraft? Wouldn't you like mm -hmm. to be able to do Minecraft in real life? Do, mm -hmm. do you think that maybe that would be something that Microsoft would say, yeah, that's a natural integration with uh, with Minecraft? Oh, yeah. oh, totally. I mean, we've already seen uh, like uh, modified previews on Oculus, right, of, of Minecraft play. Uh, I've tried it out, and it's... It's weird, right? It's like now I'm inside the world and now with, with Microsoft's technology, they're taking the Minecraft world and kind of melding it with real life, you know, putting it on a coffee table, putting it on a chair. And uh, that's that's where, you know, you, you, you're taking this generation of gamer uh, that's playing Minecraft and obviously Microsoft knows this and they're going to use that to their advantage with their new technology. So it's something I'm definitely excited for. Personally, for me, nothing beats a keyboard and mouse and just and, and just playing on the screen. Uh, but that being said, to be able to maybe virtually pick up blocks and, and build things. But then when I start thinking about that, I think, why don't I just get some Lego and just <laughs> just build? Uh, maybe I'm a, a tactile feedback kind of guy. And and obviously, maybe Microsoft's coming up with something in that arena. So I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I, I play a game called Ingress, and it's a, it's a Google game uh, on Google devices, only on Android. Actually, no, I'm sorry. It's now available on iOS, but it uses GPS, so it's, it's real-world coordinates overlaid on top of Google Maps along with portals that you can only see on your device, and it, it, there's millions of people who play it because it gets you out of your house. It gets you out of your, out of your car. To play the game, you actually have to roam around the real world. I could imagine them using something like the HoloLens to actually let you see portals. And yeah. I, my gosh, I I wouldn't pay I couldn't pay enough to to get, to get me a pair of those. Could you imagine if they did the same thing with Minecraft that there were certain things that you could only play by being in a certain location and, oh. and you could manipulate them in the real world? That I mean, obviously it unlocks a huge door of opportunity in a, a whole nother world of games. I mean, think of the ultimate uh, treasure hunt game of geocaching, right? And, and, and taking, uh, you know, a GPS technology and, you know, hiding things in the world. And now you can take the, the HoloLens stuff and implement uh, a Minecraft world or, you know, a Halo world or, or something along those lines. Um, and obviously it, it does the goal. Get us out of our chairs. I mean, uh, I, I know I, I need more exercise. A lot of people do. And, you know, we spend a lot of hours behind the screens. Uh, but that being said, gosh, that would be, <laughs> that'd be so freaking cool. But the only problem is... Uh, battery life, right? <laughs> I mean, you you know that this HoloLens probably needs to be charged, what, probably every couple few hours, especially if you're walking around and you're tethered to an internet connection or whatever. Oh, but there's speculation on that because the the number one power suck of any mobile device is the screen. Yeah. And a small projector, that, that not not like very not a, a, a strong one at all because it's only projecting onto your eyes, would, I think they estimated if it used standard OLED technology would use up like one five hundredth of the amount of power that you would for, for a screen of the same relative size. So okay. you've, you've, you could get some legs here. But as someone in the chat room was saying, oh, you know, if Minecraft dies, finally my seven-year-old will go outside and play. Can you imagine <laughs> if you give your seven-year-old a pair of hollow glasses and say, oh, you want to go play Minecraft? Fine, go outside and play. Right. While at the same time they're they're weeding the garden or washing the car. Uh, <laughs> hey, if you want if you want some redstone, it's under those weeds over there. Right. Yeah. See those weeds? Yeah. Oh yeah. By the way, if you wax the car, we're gonna give you some diamonds. I mean, blocks of diamonds, but we'll give you some diamonds. You know? I think so, we just sold it to parents all around yes. the world. That's so right. like you, yes, I'm investing. Take the rare resources and you make them chores. Yeah. Well, yes. if you take out the trash, you get some TNT. It's oh yeah. <laughs> oh wait, oh, oh. Uh, yeah, mm. no. Okay. You get to go to the the end, maybe. 
<laughs> That's a whole other world. There we all right, go. There we go. All right. All right well, let, let's move away from some happy news and move on to some not so happy news. Uh, one of the other stories that you picked as the biggest of the last uh, year or so was Gamergate. And Gamergate is one of these things that I think still confuses a lot of people because they're not really sure what it is, what happened, what it means. They they know that some people got swatted, some people got doxxed, some people were harassed. But yeah. can can you explain in non geek nerd voice what gamer game gamergate was? Real simply, it began as an attack, um, and not a physical attack, but more of a verbal online harassment attack. Uh, against a female game developer. I might butcher her name. I believe it's Zoe Quinn or Zoe Quinn. I don't know what she goes off of. Uh, but basically, uh, she was uh, trying to do, uh, uh, publish a game uh, called Depression Quest. It was a text-based game. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, she was being harassed uh, on, on this game. And what it turned into, uh, basically, it, it turned into uh, a more of a domestic uh, uh, dispute that kind of got the whole public involved. Um, in talking about uh, media uh, and talking about um, how women uh, would use their positions in, in social media with uh, major companies and uh, alleged uh, sexual affairs and things like that. I, I really don't want to get involved with that part of the conversation. But uh, the reason why I brought it up uh, really to speak and talk about video game journalism, uh, women, men and threats. Obviously, you know, we heard about colleges and, and speeches uh, where uh, events were canceled because of threats of violence against women. Um, obviously, you know, there's some misogynistic um, attitudes that are out there right now uh, surrounding this. Um, obviously, the hashtag, a lot of people um, are talking about this right now. And, you know, for me, obviously, I mean, it. first off, no one should ever be harassed at all based on uh, gender, creed, or sexual orientation or anything like that. Uh, and and this poor gal, uh, I mean, the the worst of stereotypical attitudes came to the surface about guys in games, and obviously it sparked this whole conversation, this whole cultural move, and and conversation about this. And gosh, man, I I feel terrible. Uh, it, it's one of those things that it just puts real good, wholesome people that love games and love what they are and what they're all about in just a in a terrible light. And it's, and it's one of those things that obviously I had to add to the list because it, it is important. Um, it is important to talk about. I don't want to ignore it. Uh, but that being said, it's just, it's sad. It's frustrating. And, you know, there's, there's fights back and forth on Wikipedia about it, you know, entries that are being edited over and over. I mean, when I was doing, uh, you know, research for tonight's show, just to get some updates on, on the, on the situation with Gamergate, there were literally three updates to the Wikipedia article while I was doing research. Um, and it, it's, <laughs> it's sad. This is an extensive uh, Wikipedia yeah. entry yeah. or something like, I mean, anytime you see something like this on Wikipedia, it yeah. means people are just dropping a lot of ink. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's trolling to the degree that no person, male or female should ever have to experience, especially with gaming. And it just puts, I mean, it, it, it takes a, a small few of people, uh, you know, a small group of people uh, to to just spin something bad. And uh, for me personally, I mean, it's just awful. It, it should never have gotten to the point, you know, uh, of pulling dirty cards out of, and uh, per, excuse me, pulling dirty clothes out of laundry and just showing them to the world to see um, and harassment. And it's just one of those things that, like I said, I had to pull it up in our, in our top five uh, or in our stories that we have time for anyway. And, it's just sad. It, it's just terrible. And uh, obviously for, for, for you, for you, father, you know, you see this and you don't like to see this hate. You don't like to see this aggression. And obviously as a gamer yourself, you don't like to see this either. Yeah. You know, I, one of the things that just struck me is it's okay. It's perfectly acceptable. In fact, it's encouraged for you to speak your mind. If you don't like a game, Say you don't like the game. If you think yeah. that someone is being offensive by suggesting that your game is misogynistic or it hates, okay, fine, argue it, debate. Right. This is why we have yep. words. This is why we're intelligent people. Where it got out of control was when people started equating the the right to debate and the right to disagree with someone with, well, she's a bitch, so I'm going to get SWAT to raid her house. 
because <sighs> we know how to do that. Or yeah. I'm, I'm going to find out all her personal information. I'm going to find out every person she's ever dated, and I'm going to get everything up there. And it's it's no longer I – mean, it's not a joke anymore. Uh, I, I just uh, – I don't understand how – it, it goes from, all right, yeah, this game has female characters that are looking a little, uh, <laughs> you know, presumptuous, you know, they, the skin tight clothing and obviously they try to similar things. And that turns into threats of violence, swatting, um, bad language of, of the nth degree. I mean, it, it turns into this like, wait, what are we talking about again? Um, and, you know, I'm the kind of guy where, and let's let's sit down and have a meaningful conversation, you know, uh, yelling and, and, and screaming and uh, and calling a, a SWAT on somebody. It's just what are we solving here? Um, obviously, I think we need to have discussion about, you know, women in video games and objectifying material and things like that. Um, obviously, there there are many, many people out there that feel that, you know, we should have more female heroine characters in video games or something along those lines. And um we should have that conversation without underlying threats of violence or feeling like you're under uh, under pressure to to say certain things a certain way. Um, and in this situation, this isn't this is one of those things that isn't going to end next week. It's not going to end next month. It's going to be an ongoing conversation, you know, with game developers and manufacturers. And uh, we're going to have these talks, but hopefully, we're talking and we stop arguing about it. Because right now, when I like I said, when I look at tonight and I and I look at the Wikipedia and there's just multiple edits all the time, it's just like this have, is not. There have been anything. seven edits since we started this episode. See, so, yes, <laughs> it's, it's still going. It's still going. Oh, oh and by man. the way, for, so for some of the people joining us at home, uh, we we use the term swatting. Some people actually ah. don't know what that means. They think it's just a video game thing. It's a real yeah. world thing. It means that yeah. you spoof your phone number so it looks like it's coming from the person that you're trying to get swatted. You place an anonymous phone call. Typically, you'll do something that sounds very violent so that they will respond with a SWAT team, a physically a, res a SWAT team to the house. This would have happened both to Zoe and to several other women who were embroiled in this Gamergate if yeah. they had not taken the step to call their local PD and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. This is my address. This is my phone number. This is going on right now. If you get a call, know that there's a good chance it's fake. It, it yeah. happened twice to her. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, we, all of us, anyone who's going to be on the internet, you're going to suffer trolling. It's just, that's oh, yeah. what happens. Because there's people Nature who of the beast. get bored yep. and they think this is fun. But th there is a point at which we can't call it trolling anymore. It, it, you know, it's it's now a felony. That's what yeah. you're doing. You're, you're now doing criminal harassment of somebody else. Uh, and yeah. it's it's weird that some of us are okay with that. Well, the worst, the, the worst thing about it is it's, it's one of those things that if it happens to you and, and thank goodness it hasn't happened to me, but I've not only to Zoe, but uh, to, to streamers, to game streamers who, you know, they'll have a few hundred people watching them and they're having a great time, uh, you know, streaming their favorite game. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, we've seen the videos. There, there are cops, you know, in SWAT team gear, hence the term swatting, who put kids on the ground because someone called in a threat saying that that kid just uh, murders parents or something along those lines. Um, and it, it's psychological, uh, it will mess with you. Uh, and then it makes you never want to be involved in gaming ever again. Uh, and obviously Zoe, you know, standing her ground and obviously a lot of women are coming together on this issue because it's, uh, it's sexism, it's, it's gaming. Um, and obviously everybody wants to stand together on this and everybody has their opinion and, and, and they want to hear, have their voices heard, but to go about it that way, no. That is not the way to do it. The way to do it is have a, a meaningful and f conversation uh, with your peers about it and, and stop being passive aggressive. I mean, the the edits, uh, the the comments, uh, I mean, you have sites that will shut down comment sections when they talk about this issue uh, because they don't want the, uh, the, the hate and the, and the trouble, but obviously they want to report on it. Uh, but gosh, it, it's one of those things where we shouldn't even be having to have these conversations and, and be able to get away from the distraction and talk about the, the root causes of, of these issues and instead of bringing up other things. And it's un, it's unfortunate. Right, right. Well, let's push on. We You do have another story. And, and actually, many people have heard of Gamergate and most people heard yeah. about the acquisition of Minecraft by Microsoft. This next story that you picked, I, I think 
is probably only known inside the circles that were affected by it. Circles, yeah. Circles, <laughs> but big circles, big circles. And yes. that was, and I, I never had heard about this before, the Counter-Strike cheating scandal. What what was the Counter-Strike cheating scandal? Uh, so so uh, I've, I'm guilty as charged on, on some of these things. I, I've been playing on and off Counter-Strike uh, since 1.6 days. And for those of you guys know about Counter-Strike, it's been a long, a long time incoming. But basically, in a nutshell, uh, there's a professional scene. You know, there's teams um, and the newest game out there, Counter-Strike Counter-Offensive, or excuse me, Global Offensive. Um, and it all started with a, a German player who got banned by the Esports Entertainment Association uh, because uh, he was using tools uh, hacks, <laughs> that sort of thing, uh, you know, aim bots, if you will, uh, during practices and things like that. And uh, obviously uh, they caught wind of this. And um, it's sometimes it's a little bit unclear to find out for sure uh, as far as if he was using them during competitive play. But obviously cheating in any form is strictly prohibited. And uh, obviously uh, this um, has turned into kind of a, a big thing in these circles. Um, you know, for me, competitive gaming and esports um, is a very exciting and an up and coming thing. Obviously, we're seeing it all the time with uh, with League of Legends uh, here in the states and around the world. I mean, at PAX, they have these big, you know, regional championships. Um, and when I see a story like this, where you have you know, tools and hacking, and there's another uh, big uh, connection with this, where uh, you have uh, matches being predetermined, uh, basically teams throwing matches uh, because you have five-figure, sometimes six-figure bets on these, like $10,000 for a team that's sure to win, but they throw the match. Uh, and that makes me think of, uh, and I'm a big baseball fan, you know, the, uh, the uh, what is it, the Black Sox san uh, scandal from the 1910s, I think, something like that, or the World Series scandal. But, you know, in the world of gaming, uh, and you have match fixing, cheating with bots and, and betting, I'm just wondering, Padre, can you equate these kind of things to juicing in baseball? Obviously, with everything being electronic, can these esports be trusted? I know that these games are really trying to make headstream. I mean, in Asian countries, it's big. Uh, I know in Korea, it's huge. Uh, here, you know, in the U.S., I mean, yeah, there's these niches of, of groups that are into it. But uh, when these kind of news events pop up about cheating scandals, how can these things ever gain traction? Is it like juicing, would you say? Or what do you think? Well, I, you know, I, I don't think it's even got to the point where people worry about the gamer juicing, you know, uh, the cheating scandals in gaming, because it's just, it's not that big in the United States. We've got things like Twitch, which are fantastic because it, it does expose the, the field and it does expose how many people are interested in it. Obviously, it's huge right. in Asia and other parts of the world. It hasn't achieved a critical mass outside of, of our arena right for for us it's big right. because all the people we know game but you know yep. you, you don't you don't see them reporting on espn about the latest counter-strike tournament um, unless it was a million bucks then exactly. then they would probably report on it. right yeah. right so so it, i think it's one of these things where it needs to get bigger before people start worrying about cheating scandals uh yeah yeah right i mean because like if, it, it, if we had in curl i think curling is great so i'm not Messing with anyone who loves curling, I actually like watching hey, I curling, like curling. When it's on hey. TV. But if if there was a huge curling scandal in the United States, people would go, oh. And I think that's kind of the same that they have for cheating scandal in Counter Strike. Like, what's oh, it's a game. Oh, oh okay. I, I think that's yeah. where we are. Well, the, the the problem that I have with this is for the longest time, a lot of these players, you know, they played competitively, obviously with groups of friends, clans, teams, whatever you want to call them. And then what happens is finally, you know, you get some sponsors that are willing to put money behind it, get involved with it and do something with it. And now they, we have these big leagues, we have these big electronic organizations, you know, esports leagues that try to regulate these things. You would think they that, that they would think that, you know what, hey, we're building something awesome. We're building something great. Why destroy it or even try to get rid of any of the momentum uh, when you can start to build something big. And obviously, a lot of people, and there's a whole separate argument, you could say, well, are people who play video games athletes? Are they eSport athletes or whatever? I'm not here to have that discussion yet. But um, gosh, you know, if you're building something up like this, you don't go and taint it. But I guess, as they say, you know, money's the root of all evil, right? And so when it came down to it, you know, obviously you got some players that want to get a competitive advantage. 
um, they uh, shouldn't be involved, especially in a growing uh, sport like this, if you will. But uh, but gosh, it's it's it sucks. Uh, you know, when when I'm uh, playing these games, and now you feel like the other players cheating, and then you find out that maybe they really are. It just turns other people off from from doing that same game. So obviously, Counter Strike's been a, around for a long time. It's not going to go away. We're going to see other updates down the road. Obviously, Valve's very, very strict when it comes to their tools uh, uh, to prevent cheating. And obviously, they detected these cheaters. And I'm hoping uh, that going forward, we can get rid of these cheating stories. Um, they've also also they've also said that they want to get rid of any kind of betting on games and that sort of thing as well. Fixing, if you will. Um, so I'm hoping as as time goes by, we can hopefully move past it, get rid of the bad apples, and have some really cool competitive games to watch on Twitch or wherever you watch your streaming games. Yeah, yeah. It's you know, it's just one of these things where I I love it. I, I love watching yep. gaming. Although I can't I can't do as much as I used to when I was younger. When I was younger and still healthy, in other words, when I weighed literally when I weighed 150 pounds less than I do right now, I could play games for 18 hours a day and I wouldn't get tired at all. Now if I watch someone play a first person shooter for about an hour, I start to get dizzy. That's <laughs> just one of those things. Go figure. Ginger uh, root, my friend, it, ginger root. It, it's fine. I, but you know what? I I can still watch people play card games. So, I guess there's that. Are, are we talking poker or are we talking magic here? <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> now, uh, Chase, uh, when we come back, let's talk a little bit about YouTube. But I was thinking, you talked a little bit about gamer juicing. Uh, Want to talk a little bit about the tech? Sure. Let's do some tech. Now, I have been playing with a gaming desktop for a while now. It's a, a Predator from Acer. Uh, it's It's been the staple for know-how. We've used it in our video editing stations uh, 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 episodes. We've used it in our gaming episodes. It's, it's not the fastest box on the market, but it's definitely one of the quietest and one of the most complete for the price. So um, let's go ahead and see what I use for Gamer Juice. I'm Father Robert Balasser, the digital Jesuit, and this ghostly apparition behind me is the Acer AG3-605. It's the Predator. The Predator AG3-605 series of desktops is a line of machines for the budget-conscious gamer. All Acer Predators share a no-nonsense exterior with a black matte finish, fiery highlights, glossy front panel, minimalistic styling, and easy-to-access ports. The top of the machine puts in reach the usual complement of I.O., an SD card reader, two USB 3.0 ports, including one that always provides power for USB charging, two USB 2.0 ports, as well as headphone and microphone jacks. The back of the AG3605 has ports for power, keyboard, and mouse, two additional USB 3.0, two more USB 2.0, and gigabit Ethernet. The front of the machine has a slide-away panel that hides a tray for holding your headphones when not in use, as well as a single cold swappable 3.5-inch storage bay. Inside the Predator, you'll find a well-organized group of components. Our review unit came with a NVIDIA GeForce GTX 770 with 2 gigabytes of video memory and 8 gigabytes of system memory. Though you can find Predators that are equipped with every flavor of NVIDIA and ATI graphics part and between 8 and 32 gigabytes of DDR3 SD RAM. All AG3 605 desktops use an air-cooled quad-core Intel i7-4770 Haswell CPU running at 3.4 gigahertz, sitting on top of a motherboard with four memory slots, as well as a single PCI Express 16 slot, two PCI Express 1X slots, and two mini PCIe slots. One of those mini PCIe slots is occupied by a wireless LAN card that provides 2.4 and 5 GHz 80211 A, B, G, and N connectivity. Storage for our review unit came in the form of a 1 terabyte Seagate Barracuda hard drive and a DVD-RRW optical drive. In benchmarking, our review unit posted a 3D Mark 11 score of 9465. We would have liked to have seen a bit more, but the Predator was held back by its 8 gigabytes of system memory and rotating hard drive. Still, our AG3605-UR39 posted above average benchmarks. But enough with the specs and the benchmarking. The question is, how did it run? In a word, fantastic. 
Our review unit played Titanfall, Bioshock Infinite, Goat Simulator, and pretty much every game we had in our Steam library at the full 1920 by 1080 with all the eye candy turned on without as much as a hiccup. Game and level loads were slow, again because of the lack of an SSD, but gaming itself was buttery smooth. After two months of playing with our Predator, another thing became clear. This is a quiet gaming desktop. Even running full tilt, we had no problems leaving the machine on the desk without worrying about excess noise. Try that, home builders. Yes, we also managed to get some great Adobe Premiere Pro and After Effects work done with the machine, though it could have benefited from another 8 or 24 gigabytes of memory, but let's be honest. Where the Acer Predator AG3605 line of desktops excels is in a pure fun, no must, no fuss, turnkey gaming Predator. In fact, the reason why it took so long for this review to be published is because the machine was adopted by Twit host and editor Brian Burnett, who developed a curious relationship with the Predator. We tried to take it away from him a month ago, but it was difficult. The Acer Predator AG3605 series of gaming desktops is available now. You can find them in configurations ranging from $800 to $1,300. Now, on the pro side, the Predator series of desktops from Acer are fast and simple. They truly are turnkey gaming solutions. You don't have to know a whole lot about gaming computers. You just need to know what your budget is and what kind of machine you want to get. The second thing is that it is quiet, really quiet, dead quiet. I've built a lot of systems in my time trying to eke out the last bit of performance. And I have to say, this is fast, but it's quite possibly the quietest desktop I've ever had. As I said in the review, we've kept this on our desk, not underneath it, because it just doesn't put out that much sound even when it's running at full tilt. I like that. Also on the pro side is the excellent value. When you consider the components that go into this machine, you'd be hard pressed to, to eke out a little extra savings even if you were going to home build the machine. The last thing has to be the gamer-friendly design. Everything from the handle to the uh, pop-out tray for your headphones, it screams attention to details for things that gamers want. Uh, e e that the headphone thing, we thought it was kind of silly, but we ended up using it all the time. And in fact, Brian Burnett had said that uh, when he went home and, and saw his headphones on his home PC lying on the desk, he realized how much nicer it was to have everything in one big bundle. Now, on the con side, I'd have to say that the number one thing is the lack of an SSD. Now, I know that this has a great price performance ratio, but to call yourself a gaming desktop without an SSD, it's going to leave a lot of people with the wrong impression of your product. Yes, I know it would raise the price, but I, I think it's worth it if you're going for that performance. The second thing has to be the lack of flexibility. It only has a 500 watt power supply and it only has one time 16 slot for PCI Express. Now I do like the two mini PCI Express slots, but still if I ever wanted to upgrade to say a, a two way, an SLI or a, you know, a, a nicer video card that was going to suck down more power, I'd have to be looking at upgrading all the components and that's not going to be for me. Now buy, try or don't buy. It gets a little tricky here. If you are a home builder, if you're used to upgrading your system constantly, you're not going to be happy with this box. But if you are just a casual gamer, if you're someone who likes a lot of performance and you want a box that's going to last you a long time, if you want something that can do mixed mode work so you could use this on your desktop for your regular work without it sounding like a lawnmower, then I'd say that the Acer AG3-605 line of gaming desktops is an absolute buy. I'm Father Robert Ballas there with Before You Buy. I, I, I liked that desktop so much, I actually bought one for my home editing station. I did trick wow. it out a little bit, of course. I, I put SSDs into it. And we yeah. uh, I believe we're probably going to get the updated version for down in the no-hole uh, as soon as I can scrounge up enough money. Uh, unfortunately, most of my cash has been going to quadcopters these days, so financing is more difficult to come by. But uh, Chase... Do, yes. Do you home build? I do. I do. I've been um, I've been home building ever since I could start to home build. Um, my very first computer that I can remember, other than a TRS eighty, uh, would be a uh, an old Cyrix, uh, Cyrix, Cyrix oh, yeah, system. Yeah, I remember those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those were uh, great. Yeah, but uh, it, but perform gaming performance was awful uh, for Command and Conquer. Uh, but uh, 
I like the Acer system, and I think you hit the nail on the head perfectly. If you're a home builder, this is this is machines not for you. Um, obviously, um, I, I kind of question some of their their thought processes on it, definitely including a, uh, a a wireless card. Uh, for me, I, I, I would rather them take that money and give me more juice in my power supply or give me a, an SSD drive or, or something along those lines. I know that those wireless cards aren't too much money. The other question I have about it, Padre, is if you make modifications in any way, I know some manufacturers are very, very strict. Like if you get that box home and say, you know what, I'm going to throw another hard drive in or I'm going to add in some memory, you sometimes void your warranty. Do you know if that is the case with that unit? Uh, yeah, so... A lot of people have reported difficulties with uh, Acer uh, customer support. So okay. I, I, I believe that. I've never had problems with Acer customer support, and I make sure that they don't know it's me. So I actually use a different account <laughs> when I'm right. doing stuff for things that I buy because I don't yeah. want them to treat me special thinking that they're going to get good coverage when I, when I review their product. Yeah. But you know, I can diagnose my own gear. So I know yeah. exactly what it is. If something happens, I can say, oh, it's this, this, and this. I need you to send me that. And right. they're very good about that. Uh, if this was somebody who needed to be handheld through every little bit about upgrading a system, I, again, I, I don't think that this is for them. So there's right. definitely people that this would be good for and people that it wouldn't be good for. For me, if I just want a machine that performs fast enough, it's good, and I can upgrade the parts that I need because I need to do video editing or, or whatnot, then right. This is a great box. It's it's way yeah. way more price performance efficient than anything on the market. I I found nothing that even comes close to what Acer can do. But yeah. like you said, if if you're an experienced home builder, you're probably not going to like this. Right. And, and what I was thinking in the back of my mind is I have some uh, friends who uh, play Minecraft and they they want to. Uh, a bigger, juicier system, and all they have to play on is the the system that their parents bought them. You know, some off the shelf HP or Dell, whatever, and it's using, you know, onboard video, and uh, it's compatible. It runs, but it's struggling, and they, you know they want to run something with texture packs and that sort of thing, and uh, play some other light games and uh, you know some source games. Uh, but that being said. Uh, I like the package. I, I like the fact that you know for eight hundred to a thousand dollars, you can get a really good desktop machine that will kind of insulate you for most of the popular games out there. Sure, you're not going to run 4K on it um, at, you know, 60 frames per second or higher, but it will get the job done for the stuff that you want to do and most of the games out there that most of us want to play. And, and that's what I look at. I, I, I'm not looking at the, that kind of tower for someone who's advanced. Um, it's someone who is getting involved in PC gaming. Maybe they need something more. But at the same time, they don't want to have to worry about uh, configuring something special on Newegg or Amazon and going, all right, what component do I need? Or, or, or you know, which, what, uh, yeah, forget it. You know, I don't want to even deal with it. Well, then you can just point them to this link from Acer and say, hey, you know, this is a great system to get you going. And you can do other things, video editing, Photoshop, you know, things like that. So I agree with you, Padre, on, on your review on that. I, it, it depends on the person uh, uh, as far as what kind of game or what kind of tower you need. Let's go ahead and move back into our stories. Uh, this one actually kind of hits close to home. I'm glad that you brought this one up. Uh, you were specifically talking about YouTubers who were being paid to make positive comments and positive reviews on games, which, yes. uh, ouch. Uh, tell me mm -hmm. a little bit about this. So, obviously, this is, this is something that's been... Um, happening uh, for a while and uh, some companies have been very open in, in sharing this uh, actually there was a situation with microsoft and the xbox one uh, paying youtubers uh, for coverage uh, basically in a nutshell uh, there's been a branch if you will of uh, youtubers who have been paid by publishers uh, for positive spins and reviews on games uh, even if the game sucks terribly uh, it doesn't matter. Obviously, this game, game developers want to get uh, the names out there to say, hey, you know what? This guy says that my, my game is awesome. You should go buy it. And obviously, the YouTuber has no qualms about it. Uh, my uh, my take on this uh, is ethics. Uh, for me, I've, I've always been a, a person who will call it as I see it. If a game sucks, I'm going to say it. If the game is awesome, I'm going to say it, uh, whether or not someone will pay me for it. Obviously, a lot of developers uh, and publishers out there uh, know the power of the YouTube audience. Uh, a lot of 
players who uh, are going to buy games, they will go over to YouTube and they'll see a review from their favorite personality and they want to know if it's good, if it's something that they should buy. And um, sometimes, and I think this is where the controversy kicks in, uh, there is no clear visual indication, audio, or anything that that review has been bought and paid for. And it really, really bugs me. Uh, as a content creator who's been covering games and technology for a long time, um, I've never been paid directly for a review uh, of, of anything. Um, now, that being said, when I say directly, obviously, of course, I've received uh, review units. I, I've received headphones and games and, and, and tried them out. And um, I will give my honest opinion. I will even give negative things. And I recently uh, did a review for the rig headset as an example where uh, Plantronics uh, sent me uh, their rig headsets for review. And uh, while I loved the audio quality, I didn't like the feel of the headset on my head. I didn't like the, the ability that I couldn't move the microphone. But I was honest with my audience. And a lot of YouTubers are not being honest. Uh, they're taking the money grab. Uh, they they want to be uh, uh, they want to better themselves by taking money and getting more views or something along those lines. I I don't know, but it, it just really really bugs me because I think it gives people like myself and others who truly review games uh, for the games themselves and not take the money to get their opinions influenced in any way. It um, it gives the legitimate guys out there a bad name, and I hate it. I I wish we could get it out of there because. Uh, it, it has no business being in there at all, in my opinion. You know, one of the issues is that th this is not illegal. Uh, these, no. these are not journalists. They, they don't have some sort of clause that tells them they need to disclose whether or not they're being paid for something. These are just amateurs making amateur videos. And so there's yep. nothing wrong with that, even though right now we're looking at it going, that that sounds really sleazy. I mean, I see it in the chat room. People are going, that's just nonsense. It's payola. And they're absolutely right. And right. that's why some, some of the players, like, for example, here at Twit, a while back, we had we had a staff meeting, and Leo told us, said, look, we are operating under the FCC guidelines that says we tell everybody when something is an ad. We tell everyone when we're talking about a sponsor. We tell everyone that we're using a review unit, and we pay for everything. So, yeah. you know, if, if we have products here in the Brickhouse that we actually put into the production network, we don't take freebies. Uh, you yeah. know, that's that's just not what we do. And, and I, you know, this is where I think you would benefit from having someone like a Leo Laporte in your organization who grew up in in the world where your reputation is the only capital you have. Nothing else matters. Right. Once you lose the reputation, that's it. You're done. Right. Uh, and that's that's why that's why Leo made that decision uh, to say, uh, if, if I'm going to review a phone, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to put my money down on the line. Uh, right. if, if I'm going to implement a new system, a new network in, into the brick house, we're not going to take freebies from Dell, which we could have, or from Acer, which we could have, we're going to buy everything on our own. Uh, and, you know, I think I think uh, the networks that do that don't make it clear enough that they do that. Because I think yeah. that's one of the ways to shame some of the amateurs into saying, oh, maybe I, maybe I shouldn't do this. And I don't blame the amateurs. Most of them don't know better. They, right. They've it, never been told that this is not okay. Right. And, and most of them are also obviously trying to improve what they do. Uh, you know, that they'll take the money and they'll invest it in a new camera or a new microphone or something along those lines. I get that. But, I mean, if, if, if you are somebody online who is trying to be journalistic, who, are, who is doing reviews on cases, phones, any piece of technology, and you do not have the ability to pay for it for yourself to, to give an unobjective review... Be sure to d clearly disclose to your audience what's, you know, what the deal is. You know, what I've said to, to people on my, going back to my headset review, I said, you know, Plantronics has provided me this headset for a review, and then I will go forward with my review. I try to make it as clear and clean as possible and, and try not to be a homer, not, not try to be somebody who's just going to be rah-rah just because someone's given me uh, a piece of equipment for review. And unfortunately, we've seen a lot of YouTubers who don't do that and therefore their audience has no idea if they're getting paid for it or not they all they know is yeah they're they're getting paid for it but based on youtube revenue they they don't know that say microsoft is maybe paying this uh, youtuber to say positive things about the xbox one and and that sort of thing so for me it, it's like this you know it 
we have no idea, right? You know, in the at the end of the game, at the end of the day, we don't know. Uh, so obviously ask. And if they don't respond to you or they try to beat around the bush or, or whatever the case may be and you can't get them on record to tell you one way or the other, maybe you need to find somebody else that you can get your information from on uh, stuff. You know, just like the tagline, you know, uh, from people you trust on Twit. Well, it's all about trust. That's what it comes down to. And if, if they're not going to be responsive to you uh, as far as their reviews, then maybe it's time to find somebody else. You know, that I was just thinking there is a counter to this. There's a, there's the other side, the dark side, which is <laughs> the dark in, side. in the years before I became part of Twit. So I was I was podcasting for a decade. Uh, well, even before it was called podcasting, before I, I happened to get the opportunity to work here. But I got a lot of criticism because I had a policy of no negative reviews. Mm. So it, it didn't mean that I would make everything positive. It was, if I don't like your gear, I'm just not going to review it. And I'll tell you why I'm not going to review it. And so 75% of the stuff that I would get into my lab, I would send back and just say, look, th th when you fix this, 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 I'll review it. And I made a conscious decision to do that because I said, look, there's so many negative reviews. There's so many different ways for people yeah. to be snarky and people associate snarky. In fact, I, I did this on Padre's Corner a while back. People associate snarky with intelligent. <laughs> and I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to say, look, right. I am going to dump on your product for the next 10 minutes because I can. I wanted right. my show to be, well, these are the things I like. And yeah. if if you don't see it on the show, it means I probably don't like it. Um, and that wasn't sustainable. People people want to hear you badmouth a few things in order for them to trust you when you talk about the things you like, which is right. weird. It depends, of course, on how you phrase it. And, and it depends on how you present it to your audience, right? You know? Uh, obviously some people like if you drop a whole bunch of F bombs and S bombs and, and really talk down on a product. But, uh, that being said, and I know I've been saying that being said a lot, uh, that you got to be clear with what you're doing. Uh, you had, a, you had a policy of positive vibes and information to your audience. You didn't want to do anything negative. Um, and as long as people are clear with what you're doing, uh, then you're not going to have any problems. Uh, the problems will come into play when all of a sudden they're like, well, wait a minute, Padre, I thought you didn't really like this. And now you're saying that this is the best thing ever. Uh, you know, it's kind of weird. Why Why did you, are, are they paying you to say that? You know, and it's it's one of those things for me where, you know, it's, it's easy just to be honest. I mean, you don't have to worry about uh, taking money, just be honest. But then, you know, obviously you have uh, YouTubers and, and people who create the content like, well, if I don't pay, may, take the money to say something good, then I'm not going to be able to do this. Right. Well, maybe you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, honestly, I mean, the the way I see it is, if you're if you're just trying to say something nice to get money, but you're not really being genuine about it because you're being paid to say those things, man, you really shouldn't be doing that. There's, that's just cold and wrong, and you should be doing something else. But for me. I mean, I've been gracious. I've I've gotten donations from people who support uh, what I'm trying to do. Um, I, uh, I tell it like it is. Um, I don't do as many reviews as I wish because obviously some of the coolest gear that it's out there, it costs money. And, um, you know, I, uh, want to like you, you know, I like, uh, like twit really, I want to be able to pay for what I'm reviewing and then I don't have to worry about any kind of manufacturer or anything over my head as far as, oh gosh, you know, I really hope Dell doesn't like, or likes what I'm going to say about them and that sort of thing. So, but yeah, um, for, for me, um, it's all about ethics and, and being proper in your reviews and the content that you create. And I feel that if you do that, you won't even have to worry about taking money uh, from companies to give positive reviews because at that point, you'll be making so much money giving real wholesome and honest reviews that you won't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it worked that way. I, I know. It, actually, it, it's funny. While we've been having this conversation, there's been a, there have been a couple of people, and I understand this is how the chat room works, but they've been yeah. suggesting that, well, you know, Padre gets paid for his reviews. You know, Acer oh. And it's like, but I don't. <laughs> I mean, I don't even get paid by Twit. All right. of the money I would ever make goes directly to the church. Uh, right. And that's how it works. So I have no financial incentive to give someone a payola review. It just doesn't make sense to me. It, I mean, it, it especially to me. But the other part about this, and I, I may, maybe I, I can get your your input on this. One of the things yeah. I look for is I look for when when someone says they like a product, if they're honest about the things 
that they didn't like. Because it's very rare that you're going to find someone who gives a product review that's honest, where he or she won't say, this is what it's for, this is what it's good for, these are the things I don't like. That's that, For me, that's kind of that's the trigger. If they're willing to tell me the things that would make me not want to buy it, then I, then I trust them. And it doesn't have to be a negative review. It's all about how you say it. Right. Uh, totally. And, you know, I think people started, uh, and I was keeping an eye on the chat too uh, during during that segment, and a lot of people were like, oh, oh Acers must be paying Potter to say some nice things. Maybe these are uh, gamers that build their own systems. And so they think, well, anybody who says something nice about a pre-built system must be getting paid. No, that's not the true. And you got to remember who the audience is, okay? You're doing a review for before you buy. People are going to come to before you buy to look at all different types of items from cameras to cell phones to self-built or not self-built, but pre-made computers. And so people are going to want to know all the great positives of the machine, the negatives of the machine. And I believe that you constructed it perfectly talking about, you know, lack of a power supply, a meaty power supply, uh, lack of an SSD for a gaming extreme, you know, system. There should be an SSD in there. Um, obviously you, you touched on some of the cool parts of it, you know, like a place to put your headphones and that, and that sort of thing. So it really comes down to delivery, but people out there watching this, this and, and watching that review, you got to realize that, you know, it's all about delivery. It's all about content. And if you have questions, you can probably hit up Padre on Twitter, say, Hey, I saw your Acer review. What do you think of this? And start a dialogue instead of automatically thinking that someone's getting paid. Well, yeah, he's getting paid, but he's getting paid to produce the content. He's not getting paid uh, to be favorable towards Acer or any product uh, that Padre reviews. And neither am I. Um, you know, it, it's one of the things is just, you know, how you present over years of experience and you have your style. And that's Padre's style. I have mine. And don't worry about it, you guys. It's okay. <laughs> I, I don't know about you, Chase, but I sleep very well on my big bed of money that I've been given by... Uh, <laughs> Oh Miami yes, factors. yes. In my in my diamond plated uh, uh, floor, it's it's just gorgeous gold on the. Oh, it's just gorgeous. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> this I can't stay in fashion like this unless yeah. I'm getting I'm getting the big bucks, right? I mean that you, th you, that's the payola. Well, I I got this shirt custom made. Uh, as you could see, you know, it's got the the Geek Gamer logo on here. Uh, obviously, I must be making just 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 truckloads, just truckloads of money. Uh, so much, in fact, that I, I'm going to need a bigger studio. Uh, yeah, no, it's <laughs> you guys. I mean, it's it's one of those things where you you present yourself, you try to be as professional as you can be, you give a good review, an honest review, and, and that's the thing. That's what it comes down to: honesty and trust. If you don't trust the person uh, that's delivering the review, you're going to already have a negative opinion in the in the in the first place. Uh, so I don't want to talk to you. Uh, I want to talk to somebody who's going to have an open dialogue, who's going to be constructive. If you're going to give me negative feedback, be constructive or don't give me any at all. Um, and uh, I, I hope you guys would do the same when any review that you see on Twitter anywhere. Uh, make sure you give con constructive feedback. I know a lot of YouTubers appreciate that. Uh, if you're open, and I like one guy that comes to my head, David DeFranco, you know, he was having a discussion about Patreon, Mac Pros, and things like that. Have an honest, real discussion. Um, and if you're having an honest, real discussion, then in my opinion, you're not going to go wrong. Chase Nunes, I, uh, Nunes, sorry, I always want to say Nunes. I want to thank right. you again for being on Padres Corner. It's always a lot of fun to talk to you whenever we get to, to chit-chat about gaming and tech and geeking out in general. Uh, could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you if they want to see your work? Because you've put a lot of content on the Internet. I want them to be able to see it. I appreciate that. Well, if you guys want to see what I do, uh, you can head over to geekgamer.tv. That's basically the place where I put everything uh, that I do. Um, right now, it's been a lot of Minecraft stuff. We just recently got done doing a uh, football special. But we've also done other things, like uh, we've gone to PAX. We've gone to E3. Uh, we've done Minecon, CES. And it's all on our on our on our own dime. Um, it's it's one of those things where I, I love uh, just being able to generate content and and just share with you guys and and have you guys along for the ride. For me, it's all about community. Um, you could also follow me on the twitters uh, at Nunes N U N E S, and uh, also there's a Twitter for Geek Gamer TV. I, I do game streaming, uh, and obviously this is 
Um, this is not my full-time gig. I love to have it to be my full-time gig, uh, but uh, it's something that I do because it's something I'm passionate about. Love creating content. I love community. Uh, and that's where you can find me, geekgamer.tv and at Nunes on Twitter, N-U-N-E-S. Chase, it's always, always a privilege. And again, sir, it's it was just a lot of fun. Thank you for hanging out in Padre's Corner, and uh, I'll see you next time. Uh, thanks so much, Padre. Great to be back, and uh, can't wait to see you again. Take care. See ya. Uh, folks, that's the end of this episode of Padres Corner, but, uh, you know, we'll be back next week. That's right. And don't forget that you can always drop by our show page if you want to see our previous episodes. Just go to twit.tv slash Padre. There you'll find our entire back catalog along with the show notes. So if there was a story that we covered, you can always drop in and see exactly what we had and exactly what we talked about. Now, while you're there, why not subscribe so you can get Padres Corner on your device of choice each and every single week automatically. We've got audio versions from for your iPhone or your Android phone so you can listen in the car. We've got video versions for your tablet and even high definition video if you want to cuddle up with your loved one and geek out on the sofa in front of your big screen TV. Also, don't forget that you can find me on Twitter. In fact, Twitter is one of the best ways to find out what I'll be doing during the week. I'll give you a heads up on who our guests will be and what our topics will be for every show I do on the Twit TV network. And it's also a place where you can suggest guests and topics for future episodes of This Week in Enterprise Tech, Know How, Coding 101, Padres Corner, and soon, Before You Buy. It's a part of the experience of being part of the Twit Army. Don't forget that we will be moving our broadcast schedule very soon. Starting in March, Padres Corner is going to be moving to 5 o'clock p.m. on Fridays. In fact, Fridays is going to be a very Padres-centric day. I'm going to be doing This Week at Enterprise Tech at 1 before you buy at 2, Padres Corner at 5, and who knows what we're going to do afterwards. It's just going to be a nice time for us to own the stream, assuming that Lisa and Leo aren't still watching late at night. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balasair. This has been Padre's Corner, and you've come out sane on the other side.